Yeah, yeah. We, we are the epitome of black female love. It's yeah. easy for us as, as black women to, to hold up the banner and the calls for everyone else. But again, mm -hmm. who's, who holds up the banner and the calls for us? What role does the church play in all of this stuff? Is that we as a black church are perpetuating the mm -hmm. same behavior as a patriarchal evangelicals have That's been doing. That's right. And the guess church, what? But it's the sisters in the congregation. But it's the a lot of times it is the black women who uh, bring us down more, or push or try to silence our voices more in the black church. Hold on. Hello, 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 my sisters, my brothers who come on in the room and let us know who you are and where you're from. Hello there, Sister Adams. I'm glad you're watching. Come on in the room. Come on in the room. Well, ladies, ladies, how are you doing today? I think that's our question to you. <laughs> you have truly preached that voice out. <laughs> I know. I am. Um, <laughs> uh, oh, there's this um, Belcher, um, Randolph, and Jay. Um, Dr. Wright, I don't know what's going on with my voice. <laughs> I'm, I actually sound a whole lot better today than I have been. Yes. Okay. Um, Okay. Okay. <laughs> well, that's a blessing. We, uh, and if you're like, we have been, the weather has been going back and forth and back and forth and changing <laughs> hot and cold, hot and cold. My grandmother used to say, this is pneumonia weather when fools and babies die. Mm -hmm. Fools because they strip too soon and babies because they don't know no better. Mm -hmm. You know? So I have been I'm trying to, to keep, keep myself wrapped up, throated up and everything else. But God is good. God is good. God is good. And I, I have no complaints, none whatsoever, except some of the stuff that I'm seeing come across these airways. But mm -hmm. God. Yeah, we definitely got to yeah. talk about that in a few. Dr. Wallace, yeah. how are you over in the, in the ATL? Today, I am in the ATL. Last week, I was in OKC. And the weather in OKC started out cold one day, and then it was hot the next, then it was raining the next, then back to hot again. And I got here to Atlanta, it got hot and it's cold now. So I understand what you're saying, what Grandma said, uh, Dr. Wright. This is truly crazy, crazy, crazy weather. You got, I'm doing very well. Uh, <laughs> I do need you guys to pray for one of my students. Um, who has connections not only to Tennessee and what happened in Tennessee with the uh, Christian school, the pastor uh, there, as well as a uh, connection that brought up additional pain for her from a mother Emmanuel. So uh, it's, you know, how grief does, it doubles up on you. Sometimes yeah. uh, when you remember past losses um, and, and she was not doing well today, yesterday or today. So I, I ask for your prayers for, for my student, yeah, but I'm, on, I'm doing on. well. I'm, I'm, I've been praying for the folk in Tennessee and folk I know uh, that's uh, finding themselves in spaces and places that um that cause suffering and pain <laughs> yeah. i'm sorry i just read burns, <laughs> burns, talk about burns. Uh, wallace you have to you have a stain on your teeth on your jacket <laughs> she is so wrong for that, that is so wrong oh, I'm not going to apologize for my stain. <laughs> I'm, I'm going to hold up the blood stain banner. Uh -oh. The ones that held on for the first, okay? 
I, I, I'm, I'm okay with my stain. How Girl, about go that? on with that water down red. Go on. <laughs> yeah, it may, it may watered down, but it show started out first. Oh the, man, the, the, the I, dilute I, started before the prop. For <laughs> Doctor 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 Bradford, come back and said watered down red. That's okay. <laughs> That's okay. That's okay. I, you know what? I can hold my own with both of these deltas and and these these zetas. I, 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 hey there, um, Doctor. Guess what? If it wasn't for me and for the Lord, they wouldn't be here. How about that? Uh, hold hold on. Natasha Robinson said, uh, "Benisi Burns." I was going to say when she started endorsing gangs. <laughs> <laughs> Shots fired. Y'all, y'all, y'all wrong for that. Now. Y'all wrong for that. Oh. Y'all wrong for that. But I love you anyway. I love Absolutely. you anyway, and nothing you can do about it. How about That's that? right, um, Dr. Hey. Natasha. I wish we understood our, the true history, but we will, we'll, we'll save that for another day. Hello there, uh, Sister Miller. How you doing? Excuse me. <laughs> Excuse me. How you doing? Sister Miller, it's good to see you. Good to hear your voice. Great to see you. I tell you, this this has been a week, mm. and it's only Tuesday. Mm. The killings in Nashville, um, the phones are ringing. People were calling, text messages. Is everybody okay? We have people here that have children there, and it's a mess. Mm. You prayer, prayer visuals everywhere. For those of you who do not know what's going on, um, the church in Nashville, um, the Presbyterian school in Nashville, there has been killings, um, six or seven. Mm-hmm. By a female. And they're trying to figure out the pronoun, but who cares mm-hmm. what the pronoun is? There is a shooting. Mm-hmm. And... If you continue to follow the the money, NRA is parading and they're protecting NRA. Mm -hmm. At what point are we going to fight Mm -hmm. the gun laws? Are we going to encourage the non-violent, non-gun carrying people or the organizations that fight against NRA? What are we going to do? Mm -hmm. What What say ye, sisters? I say we write, start a, a writing a letter writing campaign, not just to our representatives, but to all. We you know we need a, a letter writing campaign to all of the representatives and senators um, to say. Uh, and I wish um, I'm going to suggest to my sorority that we start writing some letters from everybody. You know, yeah. and I'm, I'm going to. Uh, invite the Deltas, the Zetas, and mm-hmm. and, the, and the Sigma Gamma the and the, and the non Phi Nuns to join us in writing um, in writing letters. We we I think until they hear all of our voices, mm-hmm. they I don't think they're gonna do anything. They scared. They are so scared of NRA. We're That's not telling is. them we want to take their guns. All we want is for those guns that were made for war. That's yeah. all we want off the street. That's they, all. And, and they were legally purchased. Mm-hmm. The guns that were used were legally purchased. Almost in every shoot. <laughs> starting, with, starting with Columbine and Sandy Hook. But and I'm trying to understand why, how it is that we say boys don't mature at a at at a rate that girls mature, girls are are, are ahead of them. Um, most boys are immature, just is what it is. But at the end of the day, you say at the age of eighteen, they can go ahead and go buy a weapon, an assault weapon or a it's gun of that magnitude. And, and then uh, when they go and they buy this gun, they don't need a background. Then the other thing is they don't need background checks. They don't need, uh, you know, they don't need psychological. Psycho, they need some it's, psychological it's, training. You know, but they, they're not. They, these are people in office right now that are 
I mean, they're Republicans, they're representatives, and it may be some Democrats too. I don't know. I'm not against the guns. I'm, I'm just be real honest. Don't roll up on the house. Uh, but God gives you wisdom in which to do all things. Guns are for responsible people. These are not responsible people that are using these guns. And now they're saying that this young lady apparently went to the school mm -hmm. at some time when mm -hmm. she was growing up. What's yeah. that all about? Yeah. Was Mr. So Sickles a part of the staff? I don't know. Mm -hmm. I don't well, know. But I the reason why she went back to that school to do what she did. That's where the psychological is. screening comes in before people buy guns. Not only should they do background checks, but some psychological screening is necessary so that um, guns are not placed in the hands of folk that don't know how to use them responsibly. That's all we asking for, for responsible gun holders. And for the war guns, all those guns that were made in the 50s for war, mm -hmm. automatic weapons, that, that whole 50, 60 rounds or whatever they hold, mm -hmm. they need to be off the street. They yeah. need to be off the street. That's you want to say that some of our comments, I mean, y'all just lighten these comments, this comment section up. Dr. Jones says the institution uses the immaturity to its advantage. Mm-hmm. And, and absolutely right. I, you know, it is 542 Central. I want to make sure that we give our guests enough time to talk, just talk freely to us. Amen. Amen. Bring her in. Oh, man. She said that she couldn't hear the host. Wow. Okay. Dr. Weems does not any need any introduction. She is an author. She's a lover of God, a lover of God's people. She's a friend. She's a sister. She's a professor. She's a, I mean, she's a, she's everything. President. You name it. She's done it. She is here in the room. I want you to say hello to Dr. Wings. Welcome Dr. Wings. Uh -oh, oh, you can hear us. us. Oh Lord. No, uh, we can't hear you. No. Uh, <laughs> let, let let can you can you go out, Doc, and come back? We're gonna, we're gonna work on that um, from behind the scenes. Oh yes. my gosh, she couldn't hear anything, but that's okay. Ooh, She'll Lord. work on it behind the scenes, and we'll get her back on. Okay, absolutely. Yes, absolutely. Let me make sure. So, some of the comments, if you could read, um, Doctor Wright, if you could read some of those comments in there. Yes, absolutely, absolutely. I want to back it down here. Mm -hmm. um, one of the things that uh, uh, Attorney Natasha L. Robinson, she who was our host a short time ago, was a phenomenal host. She said, unfortunately, there is no uniform set of laws for a person to buy a gun. It's a it's nuanced and converse, it's a nuanced conversation that is rooted in history, economics, mm -hmm. politics, and other stuff which is absolutely true. You know, everybody wants a piece of the pie. I was not familiar with lobbying until mm -hmm. uh, I was able to go to, um, I was able to go down to the state house in Jeff City with a group and we were lobbying, lobbying against the excessive sentencing of black males, uh, white males that may have cocaine, got two or three months, whereas a black man who might have crack got years. Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah. yeah and yeah, it, yeah. Was, it was really mm -hmm. ridiculous. And so mm -hmm. that was my first experience at, experience at lobbying. And we went from office to office and we were able to speak our piece. And, and at one point, we were allowed down on the floor, the house floor. So it really was a very neat experience. But uh, it's something that we have to do in order to get our voices heard. That makes sense. Thank you, Dr. Wright. Okay. Yay, we have Dr. Weems in Yay. the room. The welcome sign, they're welcoming you in. We're so glad you're here. We, we hate that you Thank couldn't you. hear the dialogue though. 
I could not hear a thing, but I'm, I'm here and I'm glad to be here with you. I miss uh, my timely wisdom sisters. Yeah, we're, we're glad you're in the room. Um, they're, they're lighting the room, lighting the room up. Hello, Dr. Weems. Come on. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Dr. Yeah. Weems, we, we want to give you as much time as, as we can. Um, how have you been since our last visit with you? Oh, it's been it's been a journey, but it, it, I've been great. I've been doing well. Thank you so much. And I think it was, I don't know, what was it last spring that I was with you? I'm not quite sure, but yes, all is well. Thank you for asking. Good. You are a phenomenal being. And I love, I've watched you over the years, of our, as I've shared in the backstage, I've watched you from one point to another, even well before my oldest daughter was born. 30, 33. I want I want you to just share with us your your ministry journey and what you did prior to your ministry. A lot of our viewers may not necessarily know where mm -hmm. you came from, um, what you're mm -hmm. what you've been and what you're doing now, if you will. Right. Sure. I'm originally from Atlanta, Georgia, and I uh, went away to college. Uh, certainly. Um, I'm not sure if I had any idea where I, what I wanted to do when I went to from Atlanta to Massachusetts to attend Wellesley uh, College, and I ended up being a, an economics major, and that is not home economics, but that is economics. Uh, eco I was an econ major, as we sometimes say now. I was an econ major, and at that time, that was very popular, quite frankly, particularly where I was in school in that part of the country. So in about the late 70s, early 80s, there were a number of women coming in onto Wall Street and into law school. Those were the two major fields at that time uh, that women from, um, from that Northeastern corridor, especially though not exclusively, Wall Street and, or uh, law school. So I, I chose Wall Street. I ended up working as a public accountant for a couple of years. And then I went to work at Merrill Lynch uh, as a broker for a couple of years and before I went into uh, ministry. So I was living, I did not return to Atlanta after I graduated. I stayed on the, in the, on the Northeast, in the Northeast and lived uh, in New York uh, when I worked for Merrill Lynch. And uh, after a couple of years at Merrill Lynch, I didn't want to do that anymore. I wanted to write, I wanted to be a novelist, quit my job at Merrill Lynch, uh, unemployed in New York, did not work. Uh, trying to work, write the great American novel. Uh, eventually, I, I uh, received a call into ministry and went over to, I would, wanted to remain in the Northeast, and so I went over to Princeton uh, Seminary. And there to get an MDiv, I knew nothing about a PhD uh, in, in Hebrew Bible or, any, or in theological, uh, the theological disciplines at all. But once I got there, um, encountered a masterful, professor of Old Testament, Hebrew Bible, Old Testament, and just fell in love uh, with the uh, Hebrew Bible. Uh, also being an ordained woman, I was also in the African Methodist Episcopal Church. I knew that back then in the eighties, I was not gonna get a church that could financially sustain me. So I um, decided to go ahead and do a PhD since the church probably wasn't going to, wasn't going to uh, hire me. Then I decided I would become a professor of, and then therefore teach seminarians and maybe teach the next generation. So I went in to do a PhD uh, in, in uh, Old Testament. And of course, I'm saying all of this. I'm so, I have not, I, you know, I'm supposed to be talking about how the Lord told me to do this. And then the Lord told me to do that. And then the Lord told me to do this. And then the Lord told me to do that. So, yeah, the Lord told me all, to do all those things. But... And, and I say that on Sunday, but on Tuesdays for timely wisdom, I'm going to tell you the human agency part of it. And then you look back on it and you can see the hand of God. But in terms of my own fleshly deciding, eh, I think I do Hebrew Bible. Eh, this is a great professor. Eh, let me see. I want to write this novel. That's not going to work. Let me go into ministry. So, you know, there is there is the uh, religious narrative and then there's the secular narrative so i'm giving you the secular narrative and you can insert all the religious language that you want in, in it uh and so i think that's the that was the journey so from wall street uh, to to ministry and but but really wanted to be a writer i really wanted to be a not just a writer but really wanted to be a fiction writer for a while there in new york 
but uh, that didn't pan out. And I, and I and so ministry, you know, as I've said to a, on a couple of occasions, uh, how hard could ministry be, right? How hard could religion be? So I went on over to uh, Princeton uh, because I thought I would still work on my novel, mind you, while doing this little religion thing on the side, taking these little Bible courses, history and ethics courses, but still wanted to write. And then I got smitten with uh, doctoral work in Hebrew Bible. A smitten Hebrew Bible. Mm -hmm. Arrested. Oh. Oh, it helps. <laughs> I, I noticed when you talked about, you've written about it a lot, um, two deacons in your church when you were younger, between the two of them, they may have had, um, what, a 10th grade yeah. education. Yeah. And God yeah. used that yeah. to catapult you to where you are now. Can you talk just a little bit about your, your upbringing in that regard? Yeah, uh, yeah, I mean, excellent. Thank you for uh, mentioning it because I think I talk about it in Listening for God. That I grew up uh, during my high school years, at least, uh, the church that I was actively involved in uh, in my high school years. My father, re my, we lived with my father. My father remarried and the woman he married was uh, Pentecostal, non-denominational. Uh, a traveling evangelist of her own, uh, uh, for herself. And we mm -hmm. went to a, a Church of God in Christ Church there in Atlanta, Georgia. Uh, it was at the time called Jones Avenue, Church of God in Christ. It later became Cathedral of Faith. I think that m many people know about it as Cathedral of Faith. But it started as Jones Avenue, Church of God in Christ, a little small, tiny little church. I don't even know we had 50 members it, that it, that I don't even know we had 50 members, but there at that church, uh, there were um, I, I went to the adult Bible study, Bible Sunday school. That's right. I, I always attended the adult Sunday school. I never wanted to go back to the children or young adult or young people's mm -hmm. um, uh, Sunday school class. I attended the younger young uh, the adult Sunday school class and was riveted by the pastors uh, and his ability to, to teach. And there were a couple of deacons in there uh, who all went, were always debating, always just kind of somewhere between knucklehead and uh, 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 and, and, and genius, somewhere between knucklehead and genius, these two deacons <laughs> were. Uh, <laughs> And, and hard headed, and just love to argue with the past, you know, just barbershop. Our Sunday school was like the barbershop. That's the truth yeah. of the matter. It was the pastor and these two deacons who were always going back about Jonah. How long could Jonah, how long could Jonah stay in the belly of the whale? How many Marys are there in the New Testament? Yeah. How, how, how could, uh, the, you know, all this kind of, how could they cross over the uh, on dry land with water? Oh my God, you know, it was barbershop. Uh, but I totally enjoyed it. I mean, I was fascinated, you know. And in the Pentecostal church at that time, and I think in some time, Sunday school started at 10 and church was supposed to start at 12. Well, church <laughs> always in my church, church service always started at 12, 30, 1 o'clock because the deacon and the pastor would go on and on and on. And it just became heated barbershop kind of debating and dialoguing. And those two, those deacons really, I mean, I learned about, I learned the Bible. I learned about debating. I love, I learned rhetoric. I learned the power of past, the, uh, the power of uh, pastors, the charm of pastors. I learned how to listen to people uh, mm -hmm. as they ask you questions. And it was one of those deacons who, who eventually invited me, asked me because he was the head of Sunday school. Uh, he eventually asked me to be the church, the Sunday school secretary, which means that I'm, I sat up there in the front after a while and took the names and the numbers of number of people who attended all the classes. So, you know, Sunday school class number one, $12.14. Sunday school class number two, $14.71. And Jesus wept. That was, that was my script. That was my script. Uh, so I, so I, I became the secretary who, who took all the, you know, how many people attended each class and how much was their offering. And that's what, that's the way you close out Sunday school at the end of Sunday school uh, each week. And that was my introduction to public speaking, quite frankly. That, I, I credit that as my introduction 
because I was so bashful, so shy. So, but this deacon said, "You'll be fine. Yes, you, yes, you can do it." And he would sit there next to me, and I would take up take all the money and add up all the little Sunday school offerings. And my job was to get up and say, "How many people were in Sunday school, and how much money did we get in Sunday school?" And Jesus wept. Amen. <laughs> Oh, yes. I love it. And it's the same and, in every denomination, black denomination. Yes, yes, yes. It's the same. And, talking about the ghetto. And a Bible scholar was born. <laughs> I, I'm hearing that because you talk about the two deacons, or the deacon and the pastor, but that is what allowed you to interrogate the text yourself. Mm -hmm. Yes. Yeah, I came from, they were very, my, my, uh, very imaginative. What they, what they first, what they model was imagination. I mean, my this deacon was just. I mean, he he was imaginative. I mean, all the questions about, well, how could this have happened, and how long was that, and how did Jesus <laughs> remain in the grave, and what did he do on Saturday, and how many, and how could Jonah have lived in the belly of the whale, and how did they cross over the Red Sea? Now, maybe in some other Sunday school classes, these kind of questions were not asked, but these were. You know, I mean, I mean, this was salt of the earth kind of conversation in my, my in my uh, Sunday school class and the adult Sunday school class at which I attended, and the pastor loved it, and the pastor engaged, and then the pastor sometimes teased the deacon, sometimes mocked the deacon, but always, but but oftentimes tried to engage, and at the level of their both of their understandings. I mean, I don't know now if I can say that they, you know, they answered it right, you know, in terms of what I would have been. But that wasn't the point. It wasn't even about answering it correctly or right. It was taking the question seriously. Yeah. It was about uh, engaging the mind. It was about asking questions. It was about pushing the envelope mm -hmm. that I think shaped and formed me uh, in, a, in a important kinds of ways for the rest of my life. Oh, I yeah. saw preacher and deacon, I saw a church that engaged questions and found, and found them to be provocative and generative. Mm -hmm. And you can definitely see that when you teach and Amen. Preach, mm -hmm. um, in your sessions, you can see it's like, where did she get that from? How did she do that? And, and what, how did she ask that question for that particular passage? So yes, that is definitely mm -hmm. shaping. Mm -hmm. As we have read Just a Sister Away, and we are hearing um, this dialogue um, 25 years um, prior to you rewriting, 18 years since you've written it, and they celebrated you in Denver mm. yeah, regarding Just a Sister Away. And I wondered, now that you have lived well beyond those years, would you go back to, before you rewrote it, or revisit it, I guess. Would you go back to rewrite and update and revisit Just a Sister Away? Oh, great question. Um, I I did, like you said, I did. There is a second edition of it, the, the hardback version of it, uh, with I think maybe two extra chapters. I don't think I would now. I, I don't. I think I'm. I, I've uh, I've moved past doing doing it that way in that kind of way i yeah. think that the book stands on its own for its for for who i was then and the kinds of questions that i had then and um and for the ways in which i see the text uh, i saw the text then and I, i'm not saying i radically see them differently now but i have a i have a i have a bigger toolkit now if you will and with a bigger toolkit i think i will begin to approach and I would write and think about them differently because my toolkit now mm -hmm. is larger. I know more, I know more methodologies. I'm, I'm in conversation with a lot more books and other writers who have been writing about those things. I, I do wanna say this, and, and you know, we're at the risk of boasting and I don't have any problem with boasting, but Justice Sister Way was a landmark kind of book in 1987, 88, 88, 87, when it was published, because there was no other book that that I've known that we know of. Those who have even actually done the research, there was no other book for Black women, Black Christian women on women in the Bible. 
yeah. about women in the Bible. Uh, and, and I think that is, it stands out. That was, there were only about two or three books that I was aware of by white women, but nevertheless, these standard, these, the standard books, uh, Edith Dean, Dean's, that D E D E N, two E, D E E N, Edith Dean had a kind of encyclopedia, a kind of a book called All the Women of the Bible. And I mean, she covered every, every mention of, of a book. Edith Dean, um, and maybe one or two other books that I could, now there were a number of Christian women's books, mind you, but nothing like Just a Sister Way, where you did not, well, let's say, when you read Against the Grain, when you read from the point of view of Black women, when you centered Black women, when you centered uh, the questions of Black women, that had not been done. So in 1987, Just a Sister Way, I, I am proud to be able to say it, it is a landmark text uh, because it represents the first of its kind. Uh, mm -hmm. I was reading Phyllis Tribble's Text of Terror. I had access to Edith Dean. I had access to All We Are Meant to Be, another another kind of evangelical Christian women's book that was asking questions about from a liberal or progressive or liberative kind of point of view. So there were some other books that I was reading, but those books were all written um, well, they were not written with black women and the question of black church women. And I want to say that black church mm -hmm. women in mind. And I think that that's important. Let me just quickly say this as well. Uh, I did not write Just a Sister Way. Well, let me, let me put it positive. I wrote Just a Sister Way with, with church women, with the ordinary reader, with informed ordinary readers in mind. I remain surprised and, and honored and humbled by the fact that it continues to find an audience in seminaries. And not only just Sister Way, but my other books, Showing Mary, I Ask for Intimacy, all of these books that find an audience and being taught in seminary, when the mm. truth of the matter, at least those books were written for church mm. women. Yeah. Uh, and clearly, seminaries are preparing ministers for church work. But my mm. point is they are not academic books. They don't have footnotes. Uh, they are not hard to read. All the things that you're supposed to do when you have an, an academic book. But nevertheless, I find I am heartened by the fact that professors in seminaries use, the, use some of my books that were written for, order, for regular, ordinary, uh, um, non-professional audiences. General, general readers, if you will. Mm -hmm. It was still available and pushed in 1996 through 98 when I was yeah. in seminary. Yeah, yeah. It, was, yes. it yeah. was very popular. I mean, even yeah. your um, uh, devotional, yeah. all of your books were really pushed. Um, and I'm glad I went to a um, HBCU where they pushed yeah. Black yeah. authors and Black yes, uh, uh, Sam, Sam. and uh, Hebrew Bible scholars. And, yeah. Uh, yeah. At that time, we were they were looking for uh, female uh, New Testament scholars. Uh, yes. mm -hmm. uh, but they were glad to have the ethicist um, Dr. Katie Geneva Cannon. Cannon. Mm -hmm. yeah. also, and oh, yes. Was pushed for, because she was a daughter of the mm -hmm. IT. She was really, yes. uh, Katie's Cannon was, was pushed. Right. You just recently wrote some information about her. Share uh, that experience of having to dive into your friend um, yeah. and be with your friend in a different way in yeah. writing about her. Yeah, that's well, good. That, thank you. Thank you for asking that. One of the things about being at this age in my life and having done this work for as long, I have lived long enough to have stories uh, about colleagues. Uh, I was honored last spring to, 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 to be the, at Princeton Seminary where I did graduate, uh, to be the Prathia Hall lecturer. And so here I am being giving a lecture for a woman who was my classmate when we were both at Princeton at the same time, uh, mm -hmm. Prathia in ethics or um, uh, and uh, uh, culture and society. But Prathia was a PhD student in ethics when I was a PhD student in Hebrew Bible. Little did we know 30 or more years ago that one of us would outlive the other 
and that one of us would be doing a lecture Ooh. in the other name. That I just got to pause with Ooh. that for a second. You just Jeez. you just never know where mm -hmm. your you just never know where your where things would how things would turn out. Secondly, mm -hmm. and then now and then to be asked to write this article in um, in the volume edited by um, Stacy Floyd Thomas and Emily Towns. Um, what's the, give me the name of it again, Dr. Brenda? I'm forgetting okay. the volume. Oh, walking, walking through the valley. Valley. Womanist explore, exploration uh, yeah. yes. of uh, the spirit of Katie yeah. Janine Camp. Katie, yeah, right. So, it, so then to be asked if I would contribute a chapter on Katie Geneva Cannon, who was, who was certainly my colleague. Uh, we are of the same generation of womanist scholars, if you will. We are the quote unquote firm, uh, foremothers or the, mm -hmm. the, uh, the, the uh, first generation, second generation, whatever you want to call us. Uh, but we are contemporaries. We were contemporaries. And um, so to be asked to write, and then this volume is otherwise, uh, Katie Air er er was also ethics. I'm Hebrew Bible. Somebody would say, somebody would ask, well, why are you writing about Katie Geneva Cannon? Because Katie Geneva Cannon, when she graduated from uh, IT, the ITC in 1974 and went to New York, to Union Seminary, she did not go to get a PhD in ethics. She went to get a PhD in Old Testament. She had an acceptance letter uh, from the Old Testament department at, at Union. But uh, Old Testament, she loved Old Testament, but the Old Testament department at Union did not love Katie back. Mm -hmm. So Katie spent two years in the, in the uh, Old Testament department at Union and, and it was humiliating and soul crushing. For two years, she took the courses, she passed the courses, she took her exams, she, uh, at, but, they, but they booted her out after two years on, under, under the excuse that her advisor says that we don't think that you are a serious student. Uh, and, and Katie had to regroup, had to retool, had to find another discipline. Unfortunately, a white feminist by the name of Bev Harrison, who's a professor at Union, told Katie, as in the script, as with the, the way the scriptures would say, come on over to Macedonia, meaning yeah. come on over into ethics. And uh, what you couldn't do in Hebrew Bible, I'll make sure you get your PhD in ethics if you come and study with me. So in that article, the uh, biblical... Uh, the biblical studies loss is womanist ethics gain is the name of the article. Woman, uh, biblical studies loss is womanist ethics gain, and by that uh, we lost we we the, the my field lost a genius in Katie Cannon, but she would go on to become the foremother the the the, the genius behind womanist ethics womanist Christian ethics. And would 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 be the first black woman to finish Union Seminary, first black woman to be to receive a PhD in ethics, uh, go on to become first black woman to uh, to be ordained in the Presbyterian Church, and certainly the most prolific writer, one of our most prolific writers in the area of uh, Christian ethics. Mm -hmm. So, Hebrew Bible's loss was Christian woman is Christian ethics gain. Mm -hmm. So you know what. What what the what the uh, human beings mean for evil, God can turn it to your good. Absolutely, absolutely. And, then, and, and so also, I I may be the one who is celebrated as the first black woman to receive a PhD in Old yeah. Testament. But I am not the first black woman to enter a department to 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 dream of getting a PhD. Katie, ten years I would in eighty four enter the PhD program at mm -hmm. Princeton. But Katie in 1974 entered the, the PhD program at Union in Old Testament. And I wanted to give homage to Katie as an ancestor to say, I may be the one to have finished, but I, I, was, I did this on the backs of a woman like Katie Cannon, who was not allowed to finish her PhD in the Old Testament. Do y'all hear this? That's, that's sisterhood. Amen. Yeah. That is true sisterhood, which is a great segue to our next question. We talk about, well, you talk, I think it was this past weekend, you and Dr. Flake talked about sisterhood. Having been friends for more than 40, 40 Nine. years. Ooh. 49. Oh, oh. 50 years. Yeah. And 
understanding what sisterhood means. It's not a fly by night. It is a journey. Mm -hmm. It's not always fast paced. It's a slow drag. Mm -hmm. And understanding how, how much love plays into sisterhood, mm -hmm. covering and I mean, it's just a lot to go into that. Share with, with our viewers your your journey in sisterhood with not just mm -hmm. Dr. Flake, but all of the, the five and six of you, mm -hmm. um, but yeah. particularly um, yeah. Dr. Flake. Uh, I, I'm grateful this past weekend that I were at uh, the Greater Allen Cathedral Church, um, where when I was in New York, I, uh, let me just kind of quickly, when I lived in New York, uh, I wanted to be a writer. I was a member. I was, I was a member of the Greater Alley Cathedral Church. So in some ways, I do count it as my home church. Certainly, when I went into ministry, I was a member there. Mm -hmm. uh, so I should say that. So I came up under them in some ways. To play. Although they are my friends, they were very good friends. Uh, but I have to admit that I was a member of their church and we were good friends even then. So I want to say that because we had known each other since Cambridge, Massachusetts, where we all met each other under mm -hmm. Reverend John Bryant and Reverend yes, Dr. Lord. Cecilia. We, so we all came out of St. Paul and John Bryant and Floyd and Elaine eventually went down to New York to pastor there. And I found, I eventually made my way to New York to work at you know Merrill Lynch and then ultimately went into some, um, ministry. And I, But I went into ministry, my point, under the flakes at Greater Allen Cathedral Church, two of them who were my very good friends. Uh, and and uh, so I, but I had known the, both the flakes, Floyd and Elaine, since our days in Cambridge. So I would say that as of this year, we, we kind of counted it up. That's 49 years ago. 49 years ago, I was an undergraduate uh, at uh, Wellesley, and they were they are a little older than me. Elaine was working in the school system uh, there in the Boston uh, area, and Floyd was a dean of the uh, Black Church program there at Boston University. So I've known Elaine Flake for 40, 49 years. Wow. Uh, and uh, so we have, we have, and, and I'm, I need to say this part about my own self. I, I think this bears, I, I think now, because this, the, your timely wisdom gives me this opportunity to kind of think through some of these things. So the, but the moment I finish this, this podcast with you, I'll probably jump into my journal so I can make sure I remember what I'm about to tell you, even myself. And that is, uh, women's friendship and, and centering women is not optional for me. It has never been optional for me. It's, it's what I have, it's how I have been shaped. It, I am, a, I'm, I'm a daily womanist. I'm not a, I'm not a, I'm not a, uh, you know, occasional womanist. I am not a woman who can, is fashionable to center black women. So why don't we do, I mean, I went to a women's college. Let me say that I went to a women's college and I made a decision to go to a women's college. I cut my teeth. I was formed. I was shaped right at the right in the midst of the women's movement. Let me just be honest. In the midst of the women's movement, yeah. that's when I was shaped. That's when I grew up. That's when I was formed. I was in ministry. I was in the church. I was just church girl. I would be in church over at mm -hmm. Allen uh, listening to mm -hmm. Juanita Sapp or Jackie McCullough or Corletta Vaughn mm -hmm. in Revival and on the and then I would run up to New York and listen to Toni Morrison or <laughs> Michelle, Michelle Wallace or Ntozaki <laughs> Shange or Gloria Steinem or Alice Walker mm -hmm. and, and, and I was in of two, 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 two jealous lovers. The church is a jealous <laughs> lover and the women's movement, radical feminist, womanist kind of thinking what is a jealous lover. So I didn't tell the people, I didn't tell the feminists that I was in church and I sure didn't tell the church folks I was running up with the radical lesbian feminists listening to Audre Lorde and others. There were two separate worlds and they never came together because the, because I, the, the the church folks were too conservative and the radical feminists were too radical. But those mm -hmm. were those my, were my, my. and so That's when it. I talk about women's friendship, this is this is I cut my teeth on hanging with women and listening to women and reading women's literature. And that's where I was shaped. 
So my girlfriends, my girlfriends in the church, my girlfriends who sometimes are more, way more conservative than me, my girlfriends who sometimes are black evangelical that sometimes I have to take them to the carpet on some of their, some of their theology and say, y'all know I don't roll with that on that kind of stuff. Y'all know I don't believe that kind of stuff. You know, and I, and I, okay, so all of that now, you know, so we, we love each other and we have fought. We have fought over theology, we have fought over issues. But as I said this weekend when I was with uh, Elaine, you don't throw away 40 years of friendship, 30 years of friendship, 20 years. So, but, you know, of, of that group that most people know about, well, it's Elaine Flake, and Jessica Ingram, Claudette Copeland, uh, Gina Stewart, and Cynthia Hale, and Joanne Browning, of those girlfriends. I mean, but that's one set of my girlfriends. So those are my, you know, my, 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 my those, they are my ride and die. They are my main ones. But then I've got other women who, you know, who are my more kind of radical black women uh, womanist, perhaps even lesbian girlfriends who, you know, we ride and die in other kinds of areas. But if, to the extent that we're talking about the church ones, these are the ones. And I'll end on this part right here about that, because someone asked a question this Saturday. Well, what do you what do you all do when you disagree? And have you all ever had fights? And I'm like, heck yes. We have <laughs> no more. Um, hell, and, and, hell yes, Doc. Hell, hell, yeah, hell, hell yes. Hell, we have. But and they don't always get resolved. And no, did we we didn't always have a kumbaya moment. Some of the mm -hmm. stuff is still on the table, but you don't throw away 30, 30 20, 15 years. You're like, right. I'm still pissed at you about that. You were wrong, but you but you That's got cancer. Love. Come on, girl. Uh, I, 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 you were wrong. You were doggone wrong about this. I still don't like that you did that, but your husband did what? Uh, I mean, so it's like, yeah, I'm mad at you. Yeah, we didn't get along. Yeah, that we said some salty to each other in, in 1912. But look at him. We sick now. We old now. We got a rock to get out of our chair now. We get, we can't we can't look in we can't read the Bible without our glasses now. You uh, you see me through this. You see me through that. <laughs> but we ain't going nowhere. But we're right. not going nowhere. I'm mad at you. I'll never forgive you for this. But I ain't going nowhere. And you yes. ain't going nowhere. And I think that that, and I'm like, don't we all do that? You know? Mm -hmm. So my friendships are not disposable. Mm -hmm. Now, mind you, my friendship. Wait, my minute, friendship, wait, you just, wait, wait, wait. You just can't go by that? You just can't go by that? No, no, ma'am. No. Say it slow for the folk in the back. Friendships, right. my friendships are not disposable. Hallelujah. You, you get you get mad, you get pissed, you you take a time out, and then you come back. That's just that's just the way it is. When you got this many years with one another, you you, you it's like it's like marriage. It's like your child. It's like it ain't. It's, it, it, this is this is not you know. It's not disposable. These mm -hmm. with these women are not disposable in my life. They've been with we we've been with each other too long, that's and it. we are so different. Sometimes we get on each other's nerves. But we're not going nowhere. That's key. That's that true. is important. Oh my God. I, mean, I, I say that because like that. There are many times I, I go to a lot of women's com I go to, a con and I'm often at some of my some of my friends' conferences saying, "You know, no, I don't believe that right there. Lord have mercy. I don't believe in that. I don't believe in that. I don't believe in that. Do you, oh God, this goes against everything I believe theologically." But I stay, but because that that too is part of my world. Women's conferences is where I cut my teeth. So even if I don't believe in everything, I believe in enough of it to keep coming. And I understand the importance of women coming together, even when I don't agree with some of the things theologically. Oh, mm -hmm. mm -hmm. uh, I, I just love that every day a woman is. I I I every day I, a I can join you right there. Right daily, there. Yeah, I ride I, and die with women. I ride. You know, my my husband has often said. My husband has often said to me, uh, "You always take the woman's side. You always take the woman's side." I said, "Men are always the ones wrong." I mean, I said, "I can just one hundred percent right." That's why. I said, I, I, I crazy? Her, is she crazy? crazy? Somebody we, drove her crazy. That's right. Said, we, she crazy? Somebody drove her crazy. we are always ninety nine percent right. <laughs> that, 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 that often that one percent, we still right. <laughs> listen, <laughs> listen. What I've discovered: there is no two sides. Well, you know, there's two sides there, so no, it's not. It's her side. That's the only side there is, bro. That's the only <laughs> side. That is. 
<laughs> there are no two sides. Hey, I'm no. use that. That's her side. Oh, get, side. Get her side and you get close to the truth. You may not have the truth, but you'll be close to it. And you ain't got to flip the coin. You good. You ain't got to flip no coin. You don't have I to do it. I love it. I love we it. We talk about woman, womanism and womanist. And looking at our current climate, mm -hmm. what does womanism, I know this is going to be broad, but I know you, you hit me with it. What does womanism look like in 25 years based on the pronouns that we're using today? Say a little bit more. What do you mean by that? Just, just, uh, Hers, that's um, Gen, Gen X are, um, I don't know if we are, I don't know if I even should get into it, but I will. I'll, I'll dive into it. Mm -hmm. um, we have some who say, well, I'm a woman too. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. You don't have the same parts that I do. You can't birth a baby, and and it's changing, and and how it looks now is different than what it was. And I don't, I've had conversations with women who are saying these same things, and they're quite angry about the pronouns and the dif differentiating. And and what yeah. would it, what does it look like? What would it look like? Or what do you think it'll look like then, at five years from now? Yeah, and you know, I'm, in all honesty, all I can say at this point is I don't know. I I, yes. I want to say I don't know. I I think that's the honest. I, you know, I, I let me say this: what I I see myself at, to the extent that I'm a teacher, or a professor, a scholar, intellectual. I am trying to prepare the next generation for for the world in which they will live in, mm -hmm. not for yeah. the world in which I grew up in. Uh, my daughter's world, my daughter's understanding of identity, identity politics, gender, sexuality is very different from mine. Not very, not 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 completely different, but but she has her own view on these things, mm -hmm. and I can only prepare her for her world. The, the, this these questions are not necessarily a part of the world that I grew up with. Mm -hmm. uh, I hope that I I try to be respectful. I try to yeah. hear. I try to listen. I try to be. I, I certainly try to be respectful. If people uh, of people's pronouns of the of how people want to be identified, I, I'm a I'm a I'm a public person, and and so I I, I feel obligated uh, to do that. Now, do I have a full grasp of all the issues? No, I don't. But no. I I do I do recognize that sex, sexuality, gender. Not only are they fluid, but they are nuanced and they are complicated. Yeah. And therefore, I'm willing to be respectful of this. Now, where the, how all this is going to pan out, what this will look like in 20, 50 years from now, um, I, I really don't know. I, I cannot say. But I do know that I respect younger people, um, uh, certainly younger, and the ones who are even my contemporaries, who are wrestling with who they are yes and and um and um and who they who what has been assigned to them and who they really are in their heart mm -hmm. i re i recognize those mm -hmm. kinds of struggles and i want to yeah. acknowledge those kinds of struggles do i un fully understand them do i understand where they're going to lead us i don't know yeah. but i That's try good. to be respectful Ooh, that's good and good answer. Um, and I think that, that is, that's womanist. That's womanism as well. Yeah, because you accept and love everybody. That's right. That's you don't right. those that I don't understand. That's right. And we leave nobody behind. We that's leave right. no one. That's that a is way the to true definition of a woman, of womanism. Yeah, we leave no one, leave no one behind. Great. Yeah, that, that's amazing. Um, thank you for that answer. Mm -hmm. Let me give you a, a light question. How about that? You love yeah. women's basketball. Lord have mercy. Listen. Listen. <laughs> Listen. I don't even know why I'm talking. I don't even know why I'm talking to y'all in March. I don't talk. Listen. I, don't even, I, I preach this Sunday, and I I preach this Sunday. I almost want to tell them, don't even sell the tape because, honey, I don't even know what I talked about because I needed to get get to my television to watch South Carolina play, oh, and I'm baby. I'm up here preaching on on in March Madness. I don't believe in preaching in March. <laughs> you know they about to play um who was it Iowa? Yeah. And, mm -hmm. Yeah. 
going to wipe the floor with them. I understand. Mm -hmm, so mm -hmm, you know that mm -hmm. I, I believe it's going to be South Carolina and LSU. I do believe that. Uh -huh. Okay. And that's okay. okay. But what do you think? Well, Texas folks from Texas might not agree with you there. Well, the well. Longhorns, <laughs> the Longhorns want to be there too. Well, I'm I'm in Texas, so you know. Um, for what what we know you, of course, we know you love basketball. But what do the coaches in women's basketball have to teach women preachers? Mama. Well, women preachers have a lot to learn from a lot of fields. Let me just quite, let me just kind of, can I just say that? Just we that. can sometimes, we can be some uh, very narrow women. Be too much. Can I just, can I just say that? Narrow mind. Uh, I, um, I love basketball. I love basketball. I love women's basketball. I, lo I love men's basketball, period. But I do love basketball. And I love the competition of it all. I love the energy. I love the teamwork. I love the discipline. I love the kind of work that goes into practice, practicing. Um, and, I, and I love the kind of black girl magic and women's yes. magic that I see. Uh, in in uh, basketball, I love it in the college students, and I love it even also in the WNBA. So um, I guess like maybe like our great grandmothers love listening to uh, you know uh, uh, boxing on the radio, you know, yes. just you know whatever. I, I, I have that, mm -hmm. yeah, and baseball by all means, and baseball by all means. I you know with Jackie Robinson and Hank Aaron, I enjoy in terms of uh, basketball, but I I love the coaches. I I love I love Don Staley uh, uh, at coaching South Carolina. I love Coach Joe uh, there at, with Ole Miss oh. and the sister and the sister you all have there in Texas who is just fly as she wants to be. Oh yes, uh, and, oh, yes. Uh, absolutely. And so I mean I, I love seeing, but I, I I mean I love all the, the women coaches, uh, you know, regardless of race. But I I love that and I love the teamwork and I love their that they have to coach each young lady differently than a, than the other. But I love that they will get in their grill and just kind of wear them out about something they haven't done. I, I love all of that energy because in the end, I think I am, um, I, I love that kind of fire. I love passion. That's what yeah. it is. I love passionate women. I love passionate work. Uh, I love the enthusiasm. I love the swagger also. I love the kind of swagger. I, I, you know these these eyelashes and these long ponytails. Girl, I can't get next to the eyelashes looking like snuffleupagus. I, you know, I can't get. I can't. Get, <laughs> I'm like, I, I can't get next to all of that. You know, and the long, long ponytails. I'm like, long oh, man, my, girl. If my if my people who are called by my name <laughs> will humble will humble themselves and take them eyelashes off, but nevertheless, oh. that's not my business. That's oh. that generation. That's not my generation. Oh, that's no. what they and they got the nails and they got the eyelash. They got the but that's all right, baby. You just do you and get that basket, get that ball in that basket. I don't care. Yeah, I, so, yeah, I don't know yeah. how they make it, how they dribble with them long, like with them long baby. nails. I, they I, crossing I over. Oh, and, and getting making a shot, baby. They doing yeah. it. Oh, yes, ma'am. Oh, yeah. Yes, they baby. Got it down. They got it down. Trust uh, yes. me, they're doing it. Trust me. Back but in I, my I, day, I, no, I couldn't do all that, but I just, no nails, hair back, get the shot in, but they are finessing this thing. They are one, They are black girl magic. They are doing the doggone thing. That's and it. they are doing a wonderful, wonderful job. And it just makes my heart sing. Now, you know, I'm, I just, I love all things black women. I love all things women, but I certainly love all things black women. So right now I've just downloaded the jazz singing of Samara Joy, who will be on Good Morning tomorrow morning, those of you who are interested. So the, the little jazz, young jazz singer, Samara Joy, who's just, you know, breaking out. There's so much buzz about her. I love seeing these young women claiming, their, claiming and owning their space. Well, we are yeah, I, I think that we're at time. We're at time. Yes. My God. Come on back, Dr. Weems. But stay stay backstage. We wanna wanna celebrate you okay. a little more. Sure. Next week we will have um in Taylor J. Hill Esquire. We are so excited that we you'll be back with us same time next week, same time, huh? Same day. 
Come on back in the room, the timely wisdom room. Love you, and there's nothing that you'll ever be able to do about it. Bye.